Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape oil painting demonstration. This is your painter in residence. I'm Francis McCarthy, and the painting I am bringing you today is a little mini painting. It's called Edge of the Pasture. It's a 4x6, and I painted it, I don't know, I'm thinking three or four months back because I'm so behind on processing my videos. And yeah, so you've heard it, so I won't bother going into that. But um, hey, as long as I stay ahead of you, right? That's all that matters. Anyway, um, I painted this scene before and uh, sold it. I think that was a mini painting too. And um, a few different takes on it this time. I kind of kind of went with more of a cooler sort of approach although I'd used I didn't modify the reference I just kind of had it in my brain like with a lot of greens you could go oh I can go cool or I could go warm and uh, I was looking at a, a review of uh, a guy on uh, YouTube reviewing some cameras and it's very interesting how he was in a camera store and you know photographing himself with uh, different cameras and some are very cool and some are very warm and uh, that's just the white balance uh, adjustment in the uh, in the camera and generally it's a well you, know, you can use an automatic adjustment or set it yourself but uh, the switch the switch up between cool and warm is always interesting you can take a, a painting that's essentially cool um, and warm it up very easily by glazing it with um, I don't know some form of yellow like I like transparent earth yellow uh, which I would modify with a little bit of the permanent orange, uh, which is also transparent because it uh, has a bit of a greenish cast. So a little bit of orange kind of counteracts that and gets you right in the uh, the yellow, warm yellow range. Um, or heck, you could go all the way and glaze it with a uh, transparent earth red, uh, which is like a burnt sienna tone. And, uh, you know, you're going to be warm. You're going to be warmer probably than you wanted to be but uh, that's one quick way to get a, a real super quick tonalist effect I think a lot of tonalists did do that did uh, glazer well a lot of tonalists glazed that's for sure but did they use uh, burnt sienna I don't know actually the original burnt sienna the earth tone not the uh, one you get from Windsor Newton it's actually a modern um, it's iron oxide or something like that uh, is it's partially opaque so that would end up covering a lot of things and when you're glazing you yeah, you can glaze with opaque colors you're just going to end up having <laughs> to redo a lot of things because you're going to you're going to be covering up your painting pretty good pretty well but um anyway uh hasn't been a big week for painting uh, for me in fact i think i've done a total of zero paintings this week um, i'm getting ready though i'm home for lunch thursday March 7th, 2019. Um, home for lunch in the studio. I've got I've got some reference loaded up. I've got uh, I cleaned up my palette, which had gotten pretty dry since I've been doing a lot of other things. I've got students now and uh, so many things pulling at me. But um, what's the point in being a painter if you don't do paintings, right? So, and I don't worry about gaps like that. The, uh, I mean, for me, actually, I'm pretty, pretty well dug in. It takes a serious gap. I, I, for example, have been on uh, several, uh, you know, four and five week vacations uh, since I started my painting career. It hasn't adversely affected me at all. As a matter of fact, maybe it even has a positive effect because I collect a lot of awesome reference. I can't wait to make paintings of but um that said i don't recommend big gaps in painting i've talked about that before don't do it paint every day if you can't paint draw if you can't draw quit watching netflix and, and pick up a pencil and do some drawing come on yeah sorry to tell you off but you know you needed to hear it just turn the tube off turn off the uh the youtube or the internet too do some work make something you know um you weren't put here just to be a spectator right maybe you were maybe yeah maybe you're spectating on my channel which is fine if you're a non-painter non-artist type you just like watching people paint i know a few people like that a few of them collect my work that's all good 
you can uh, you can just take this in as entertainment and uh, save. Uh, just uh, know the the lecture is directed to the folks that are at least wanting to be artists. You know, and artists. Boy, I love this can of worms. I was going to just talk about the uh, the whole labeling people as artists, but it is a can of worms. Uh, suffice to say, I'll give you my quick opinion on it. An artist is a person that creates art. Uh, it could be visual art, it could be music, it could be um, putting plays uh, on, or it could be writing, uh, even writing I consider to be one of the arts. So it could be a movie maker, um, but you're making something uh, and not just some conceptual piece of uh, whatever um, that, uh, you know, is maybe veering into the realm of craft. Now, where I work at the Coriette Center, we have a lot of people that are potters. And potters are, is that art? I don't know. I mean, they would like to think so, some of them, you know. It's not for me to say. Um, at least they're doing something. That's how I like to look at it. And I have seen some pottery that functions on a pretty high level it's pretty good so maybe so maybe so what's the distinction between craft and art I, I think it's subjective it's hard to define I certainly know what I think and I can tell you on a case-by-case -case basis but I really couldn't make a broad generality as you just experienced uh, me go through uh, anyway um, if you do art, you're an artist, and if you don't do art, you're not an artist, and that's it. But a lot of people like to, they think, they think that artists get special uh, treatment, and in some, some cases we do, but less and less, I think, since the water's been muddied by so many people that aren't actually artists, considering themselves to be artists by just the way they live their life. <laughs> I live my life like art. I'm an artist. Okay, fine. You know, then the term starts to lose any meaning at all, uh, which has happened already. So I guess this is, we're beating a dead horse, aren't we? Yeah. Um, you know uh, what? I thought I'd talk just a little bit. I've got uh, I'm, I've got one student I'm I'm working with on uh, teaching how to do oil paint, and she's a very good artist. She's a very good drawer. Um, she's been working with. Um, uh, watercolor pencils as her primary medium and uh, mostly because it was a good transition for her out of drawing you know and uh, not not a bad idea you know and her, her work is really nice looking she wants to move into oil paint and so has been taking some lessons from me and uh, it's a bit of a different approach to oil painting than what I do what I do is uh, sort of loose and uh, fractured um, where what we're doing together is a, <clears throat> a bit more um, refined and delineated so which is all good I've done I've done both types of painting and uh, uh, that got me thinking about oil paint and <clears throat> pardon me you probably heard me say it before but I think oil paint is the greatest of all art media I've worked with all of them they all have their advantages and disadvantages, but oil paint has the least amount of disadvantages and the most amount of advantages. And using oil paint, uh, you don't really, you can't really get straight up watercolor effects. So if you're looking for that real wet watercolor effect, stick with watercolor. But um, you can get transparent effects very easily with oil paint, or you can go as opaque. You can paint it as thick as your shoe if you wanted. It's going to take a while to dry, but. Can lay paint on as thick as you like and that's one of the beauty parts of oil paint and and when you contrast oil paint say with something like pastels or oil pastels you can get uh, certainly get interesting effects with both of those media no question about it however i could probably duplicate a lot of that with oil paint if i needed to you know one thing i'd do is maybe squeeze the paint onto a piece of cardboard so i had less actual oil in it more pigment um, will give me a more of a dry kind of effect. That's one uh, technique that uh, Toulouse Vautrec used to used to use. Oh, <coughs> pardon me, a little frog in my throat. Um, I've, more than a few artists have used that as a technique. Um, what I like about oil paint is the flexibility of it. So it's you lay it down and it stays wet long enough for you to bring in other colors and modify it. This is the great thing about oil paint. 
and then when it's dry, you've got the whole other a whole other series of wonderful things you can do, like glazing or dry brushing or scumbling. It just goes on and on, and and the oil paint works with you; it never works against you. Um, when when you see bad oil paintings, when you see things that have gone wrong, usually it's you know amateurs, and because it's of this. Uh, kind of slick quality of oil paint where it is malleable and uh, you can easily push one color into the next. What a lot of times they'll do is over smooth their work. They'll just uh, brush everything together so it looks almost like an airbrush painting except a very greasy airbrush painting. <laughs> and funny enough, I mean, there's grease in it so it's not hard to get a greasy look. Um, I prefer to, um, to always make my, leave my brush strokes pretty much alone, not to overwork things. And uh, I guess that's another little thing I was going to touch about. Uh, how, how do you know when your painting is done? How do you know when your drawing's done? What's the secret, you know? Um, this is something I, I, I pretty much don't have to wrangle with, uh, hardly at all, uh, because I almost always err on the side of things being slightly less than done than overdone that looks better always when you overdo and overwork your painting you you basically kill most of the nice things that were in it and you destroy them you destroy your beautiful strokes by adding ever smaller strokes over the top and you get this kind of rice grain effect it's not good so how do you know well, one of the ways you know is by being aware, first of all, that it's something that can happen. You can easily overwork your 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 paintings. So just if you need to put a note on your palette, like, is this done? You know, question mark, because it, it might be, you know, and one of the uh, secrets to the way I work is I'll do a big color lay in. I try and get everything done there and I usually know what I can't. Um, and then I leave it sit for oh, a few days or even a few weeks sometimes looking at it thinking about it and then I'll come in with my glazes and my second pass and at that point in time I've gotten pretty used to it being the way it is so there's just a few things I usually feel I need to modify and I'll modify them I and that second color pass might take about the same amount of time as my first color pass but um, Try not to overdo things, especially like with a technique like dry brushing. Wow, you can really overdo things with that quick. Anyway, that's enough of rambling for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all you new subscribers. Uh, welcome aboard. There's a lot of videos and content for you to check out there if you like. Uh, feel free to leave a comment or a like or you know send me an email if you want anyway i'll be back over the weekend with another uh i'll be a past master so meanwhile take good care and stay out of trouble